more days for the men and women and there's 19 more nights for the little kids. They get to sleep in and wonder with anticipation of what Christmas morning will bring. When you think about Christmas, you think about the excitement of what is taking place. The most wonderful time of the year. There's people that are laughing and people that are smiling. There's people that have a heartfelt desire and an idea that, that this is going to be a wonderful time. You have that joy and anticipation within your heart. But then it's also the busiest time of the year. And sometimes the joy that we have and the excitement that we have turns into so busy. So sometimes we either are excited about Christmas or sometimes we're kind of depressed about Christmas. Not everybody that you see will have a smile on their face. Not everybody that you see can afford what everybody else has. Oh, but it's the most wonderful time of the year. But the ones that are depressed today about what they can't afford are the ones smiling when the ones that are excited get their credit card bill in January. <laughs> because you know what? Most of us, if we were honest, we cannot afford Christmas. It is not about the presents that we put under the tree. And if our country, if our church, if we would understand, it is all about the baby Jesus and not about the Christmas presents, not about everything that we do. We need to slow down. We'd understand this song, Joy to the World. Why do we have to remember that song? It's because the only thing that we can have in true joy within our heart is if we slow down and understand the purpose, understand what it's all about. I wonder if Isaac Watts in the 18th century thought that we'd be singing that song in the 21st century. We could literally spend an entire day an inspired month talking about what that song represents and what Psalms chapter 98 truly is. But I want to take just three lines off of that song. The first line I want to take is joy to the world. The second one, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. And the last and most important one is let every heart prepare him room. You know, that's the most important thing about Christmas. Let every heart prepare him room. You know, when we think about what Christmas is all about, we read the Christmas story, and we know, we know how, how the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and how Mary was conceived and, and how Joseph took upon her and, and betrothed to her and, and how all of the events of that Christmas story took place. But now there was a, a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethany in order to be taxed. It's found in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. There's a couple of phrases in here I want to talk about. But we have to say joy. We have to talk about what joy truly is. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring you great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Imagine this. From the Old Testament to this moment, there hasn't been a word spoken about God for 400 years. It has been silent for 400 years. And they're lowly shepherds out on the field keeping watch. And God sent the angel to them. And the Bible says they were terrified. Terrified. The glory of the angels terrified these shepherds. Now, I'd be honest with you. I, there, there's a lot of times I get scared. Uh, you know, I love roller coasters. Everybody like roller coasters? I'm a roller coaster fanatic. You know, the, you know why I, I love roller coasters? That being on the very front of that roller coaster, and it's like that free fall, and you just like, ah, and your arms are up, and you just feel like you're going head first. It's a terror. It's awesome. It's exciting. When that thing comes to an end, you think, oh, we made it through it. We made it through it. We made it through it. Sometimes we can man make our terror. But you know, it has been said on the news this week that the level of anxiety and terror over the last seven days 
has gone up 27% in the United States of America. Terror. The fear of the unknown. The fear of what could take place. The fear of the uncertainty. That causes terror. These guys have not heard from God for 400 years. It has been generations and generations and generations before they have heard from God. They thought God was silent. They thought God was not going to do anything. But here's what he says. Don't be afraid. I'm going to bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. I like that. I'm going to give you somebody that's going to give you great news and great joy to all people. See, joy had to come into this world. And joy to the world is for the entire world. But you have to ask the question, why wasn't there joy? If joy had to come into this world, if Jesus had to come into this world to give joy, why wasn't there any joy? What was the problem? What is the cause of the joylessness? Well, just like in our culture today, it's spelled with one word, three letters, and starts with S, ends with N, and it's I. Sin. Sin causes the, the joylessness within our life. The same thing that has been robbing you robs them. In particular, the time of the Bible, history was all about the nation of Israel. Reminds us of our country today. Listen to this. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are. Loaded down with the burden of guilt, they are evil people. A corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs to them. The children of God turned their backs on the Holy God. It's bad. It's almost as if Isaiah was looking at your Facebook posts, was reading your tweets. It's like he was listening to your phone calls, reading your texts. Sometimes it is very similar to the nation of Israel, to what we are doing right now. Which, what could God do? How could God bring joy and peace into a country that despised him? How could he reconcile? How could he start to start in the Garden of Eden and the brokenness of our life and the separation of God? How did that happen? In Isaiah chapter 1, he said the children of Israel have, have, have broken. They, they, they're, they're, they're people of wrath. They have no love, and they, they've broken my commandments. But then in eight chapters later, Isaiah says this. For God is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called a wonderful counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestors, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord's heaven's army will make this happen. God has put into place a plan to restore all men to him. Not just Israel, but all men. In the midst of the darkest day, Jesus showed up. Israel had no hope. The world had no hope. We have no hope. But in the midst of the darkest day, Jesus shows up. What is your darkest day? What is it that, that you have no joy in your life? What is it that you say, I, I just need God to show up. I've been praying for it. I've been excited about it. But the anxieties and the stress of life overshadow me. And Israel was in this place. They just rejected God. But God did not reject them. And he came into their life. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the right time came, 
God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves in the law so that he could adopt us into his very own children. And because we are children, God has spent he sent the Spirit of God, his Son, into our hearts, prompting us to call Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God owned child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. I said, you can't get to heaven on your own. You are broken. I had to send my son to this earth to be born of a virgin, to live 33 years, to die a death of a perfect life, to atone, to pay for your sin. God had a plan, and that plan was from the beginning of time. We have a plan. When God's children, the nation of Israel, was set the very ends, it was discouragement, darkness, defeat. They had no hope. For 400 years, they were destitute. And into that joyless life entered joy. Into our world came the joy of all joys, Jesus Christ. And many of us today are struggling within our life and there is no joy and there's no peace and there's no way to understand what's gonna take place tomorrow. And in our joylessness, Jesus wants to give you joy. He wants to give you peace. And he wants to give it to you through his son, Jesus Christ. See, there's nothing else that can satisfy. We try to satisfy in many different avenues and many different things, but ultimately the only way to give us joy and peace is having a relationship with Jesus. And into the world came the joy of all joys, and his name was Jesus. The second thing is joy had to come in from, joy had come in form of good news. Jesus is the only good news. He had to come in the form of good news. Sometimes Christmas is joyful, but sometimes Christmas is hurtful. It all depends on the way you look at it. If you look at it around a Christmas tree and your little kids or your grandkids are opening up presents, oh yeah, you're gonna have a smile on your face. You see everybody that's having a great time around the dining room table and there's plenty of food out there and everybody's pigging out and yeah, you're gonna have a good time. But if you're like me, and probably many of you, Christmas is also a very sad time. You remember the traditions that you used to have with your parents and with your family that have passed on and have died. You remember the things that you used to do and the joys that you had and the memories that you have. And although Christmas is a very joyful time, it is a very hurtful time. It's a very hurtful time because sometimes that we do the things that we want to do, but yet we remember the things that we used to do. See, an event won't change your heart on Christmas Day. The event of Christmas will soon pass. The credit card bills will come in. The toys will be broken. The things that they were bought will no longer work. The perfume will be out. And you'll look back in about March or April and you'll say, wow, we sure did cast a lot of debt. For what? For an event. We sure did a lot of things. We had a great time for one day. The angel of the Lord said this, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring you great joy. Who needs a little joy in your life? If you need a little joy in your life, raise your hand. We all need joy. We all get discouraged. We all sometimes can look at the negative. And he says, don't be afraid. I want to give you good news and great joy. Not just I want to give you a little bit of a sprinkle of joy. I'll ask you that. I want joy. I need joy. I need God to touch my life. You know, we certainly get a lot of bad news. A lot. You know, raising Two boys, um, I get a lot of bad news. Um, I get my little text alerts about classes and, and they needed this and they're below the average and uh, we have to have a little talk and, oh, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. I said, it better be fine. 
And they look at me like, yeah, you're a little bad. So, no, we get bad news all the time. You get bad news at your home. You get bad news because of health. Sometimes that bad news, sometimes the fear of that news can overwhelm us. We hear the news, you can watch CNN, you can watch Fox News, you can read the newspaper, you can get on Facebook. Bad news is real. Bad news is overwhelming. You being a Christian is not gonna win the battle by itself. We need God. We need God's help. We come to church and we hear a sermon, we sing some few songs, that doesn't change the fact that the world is not for you and the world hates you because it hated Christ. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do when the world does not love us? The world is broken. We, the body of Christ, we have the answers. Are we tracking with him? Are we loving him? Or are we saying, that's just jacked up. That's just too much. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to serve him. I don't want to do that. He says, your world is broken. Your salvation is secure. Yes, but the people around you, it is broken. I need to take over. Not only Christmas time. It's, it, it's going to be fun doing the Christmas. And it's going to be fun having the dinner in here next Sunday and having, having all the tables. And we're going to serve the food. And we're going to sing some Christmas carols. It, it'll be fun. But being fun on Christmas doesn't change the world. What we must do is we must take John chapter 1. I want to read five verses. And, and in this, when he uses the word word, the word translated is logos, which is translated Jesus. Okay, so when you use the word the word, we're talking Jesus. In the beginning, the word. In the beginning, who? Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish the light. Wow. Jesus changes everything. If we only celebrate Jesus when he's a baby, when we only celebrate Jesus on Christmas morning, we've lost the point of Jesus. Joy to the world? Why? It's because what Jesus did, he came into this world to reconcile. He came into this world to save you. He came into this world to transform you. He always was, and he always will be. He gave us life, and he gave us light. In John chapter 1, verse 14, so the world, so the word, which is Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, one and the Holy Son. The good news is that God loved us so much in the midst of our sin that he loved us in order to get out of our sin. Let me give you a definition of the point of Christmas. And it's not the presence and it's not the manger. It's a bigger point than what we could ever discuss about the Christmas story. Jesus stepped out into our world so that we could one day live in his world. Jesus stepped into our world so that we could one day live in his world. We like to celebrate the baby Jesus. We like to talk about joy to the world. But you know, on Christmas morning, he was very vulnerable. His life was very vulnerable. People hated him from the day that he was born but he lived a perfect life to die for you and I. Christmas, Jesus steps into our world so that we can have redemption. When we celebrate Christmas, 
Do we remember what Christmas was all about? This was the first day of God's plan being put into motion. The angels were excited about it. He said, don't be afraid. I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you good news. I'm gonna give you great joy. It doesn't take place right now. There's a lot of times that Christmases are bad. There's gonna be a lot of bad news within your life, but here's the deal. When we put our faith, our hope in Jesus, what we have is we have prepared a place in our heart for eternity. That is the good news. The good news is the future. Point number three, joy has become Christ had come for all people. Christ has come for all people. Not just the churchy. Not just those that have been baptized in the church. For all people. Well, what do you mean? What about those bad people? All people. See, I had this conversation a few years ago. Um, my brother uh, was put into prison uh, for raping a young lady. And it was devastating, a little town in Wamego, and everybody knew the Thomases, and um, it, was, it was bad. Tried, he, he was three years older than me, and tried to get a date for prom after your brother just raped somebody. He's, nah, I don't, I don't think that, you know, nah, nah. But that conversation with Ronnie, sitting in the prison in Hutchinson, Kansas. I was a pastor of this church at the time. I had to speak at a conference in Tyler, and they gave me this stupid topic of forgiveness. And I, you can't, uh, I, I, I can speak on a lot of topics, but speaking on forgiveness when you don't know how to forgive is very difficult and I fought with that I about canceled that trip to Tyler 10 times I hated it but I decided one day to go to Hutch never been in that prison before and don't really care if I ever go back but I remember sitting in the state penitentiary talking to my brother that I haven't talked to in probably 20 years. Didn't like him. Couldn't stand him. I would even use the word I hated him. Hated him. Bitterness, resentment, hatred. And I looked at him and he could tell that I was not a happy camper. He said, sit down. He said, uh, I said, I hear that you're a preacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He goes, what kind of a preacher are you? I said, well, what? what do you mean? He goes, are you one of those preachers that stick their finger in their face and tell them to shut up? Tell them to get out of here? Are you one of those preachers that try to love and try to bring people to Christ and to forgive people? My brother that was in prison taught the pastor a very, 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 Big lesson. Everyone needs forgiveness. I may not have performed that task. I may not have sinned as big of a sin, but I'm a sinner. And I needed Jesus to forgive me or I would be destitute. I'd be going to hell. And before I left, I said, Ronnie, I ask you to forgive me. I have held animosity and hatred and turmoil in my heart towards you. And he looked at me and he said, Bruce, I am sorry. I have not only failed you, but I have failed my family. I apologize. <laughs> I got up and walked out. You know, it didn't bother me any. I was crying. I, was, I, guess, I hated that 45 minute drive back to Wichita. But you know what? That was the first time that somebody that I hated, I forgave. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus does. 
Jesus looks at the world. He looks at the dirty, rotten sinners. And he says this. I want to forgive you. I know that you're not perfect. I know that you're going to break the law. Even the, the thief on the cross said, today remember me. And Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. It was the sinners, the spiritually sick, that drew Jesus' attention. And you know, even, even when you're talking about um, in Matthew, it says this in Matthew chapter 14, as I walked along, he saw Levi, whose name is Matthew, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciples, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. Along the way, many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners, there were many people of his kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of the religious law were there, the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those that know they are a sinner. That was my Lord. You know what I like about that? Jesus can hang at my house because he hangs out with sinners. That's me. I am right there. I love it. We don't have to be pious. We don't have to be perfect. We have to know that I am a sinner. And Lord, forgive me because I'm a sinner. Before we can gain access to heaven, we have to realize I need Jesus to get me there. I'm gonna give you a great joy. I'm gonna give you great news. I'm gonna give to you somebody that can give to you what you can't get on your own, and that's access to God. Why? is because he became flesh and dwelt among men so we can have access to Christ. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Those who are lost. Yes, Jesus came on Christmas, and it was a beautiful event. But as we know, Jesus died for all men. It was beautiful. The event was beautiful. Jesus, the angels, the star. It was beautiful because God was there. But guess what? It was nasty. It was in a stable. It was with animals. It was hay. Animals do things. But you know what Jesus did? He didn't want to come to the palace. He wanted to come to your house. And he knows that your house isn't perfect. And he's asked us to do this. Make sure there's room at your house. For Jesus, the son referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is a salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. No other name. Whether you get, give your life to Jesus because he was a baby. Whether you give your life to Jesus because he died on the cross. We give our life to Jesus because he is God. And he loves you. And he broke out of heaven. And he came to this sin-filled, broken world. And he had you in mind. And he said, I want you. I want to give to you what you can't give to yourself. I want to give to you forgiveness. Jesus, the Son of God, died for you and for me. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's not about the presence. It's about Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Father will be saved. 
No wonder why the song says, let every heart prepare him room. See, it's a choice. It's a choice. Do we have room in our heart? Do we have room in our house? Do we have room at his birthday party? See, Christmas, we get so busy doing, we really forget why we're doing it. As we're talking on staff today about things that we can do. Um, and next week, we're having our Christmas dinner in here. And um, thank you for volunteers for who's doing, we're doing 15 hams, 15 turkeys, a couple of hundred pounds of potatoes and dressing, and we're just doing all kinds of stuff, and it's going to be packed out. We're going we're gonna to come in here at 1030. There'll be chairs and tables in here. We're going we're gonna to go through the door and get our food in the gym and then come back in here, and we'll have some music, and, and, uh, uh, and then we'll have dinner, a family dinner. But in doing that, anytime you have a family dinner, um, I, I remember my mom said, Bruce, you need to clean the bathroom. Dale, you need to do this. So everybody's busy doing something because family's coming over. Clean the house, right? Everybody does that. So at, so we're going to do some family stuff here in a little bit too. But we need to remember what this is all about. It's about Jesus. And we're going to celebrate him on Christmas. We're going to celebrate him on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, the night before Jesus, the night before we celebrate his, his birth, we're going to worship his name at a Christmas Eve service. And I'm going to ask, and you're going to hear this in a little bit, I'm going to ask every family to remember Jesus on his birthday. What you would buy in a gift for your child. Bring that gift for Jesus. Ooh. It's funny that we remember things, but we don't remember the thing. We don't remember Jesus on his birthday. There's going to be a manger down here on Christmas Eve, and we're going to pack the place out, and we'll have the communion service the bread and the, and the juice and the pastor Tim's going to come and talk about the Christmas story but you know one, one thing I think we forget in training our kids is the way that you have joy is by giving things away the smile that you see on someone's face when they need something and you provide something not because they're cons and not because they're trying to get something but a genuine need and you give it to them, God is using you to fulfill a need and you are being the feet and the hands of the one. So on Christmas Eve, we're gonna have a manger. And I'm gonna ask you to teach our family, teach your kids what it's like to give a gift. Not to mom, not to dad, not to brother, but the birthday boy by the name of Jesus. And if we can do that, we can train our hearts and train our lives to make room for Jesus. You know, so often we celebrate Christmas. A lot of people celebrate Christmas that have no idea why they celebrate Christmas. Uh, it's a reason for the season or Xmas or Santa Claus. You know what? The family of God do you know why we celebrate Christmas? It's because Jesus, the Son of God, loved us. He left heaven to come to this stinky, sin-filled world that hated him, that beat him, that crucified him, that ran thorns on his head and buried him. But guess what? He arose. He lives in heaven, and he loves you. We celebrate Christmas because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let us never forget what Christmas is all about. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we do want to say thank you. We do need your joy in a very chaotic time. We need to receive you as our king, as our Lord, our preeminent one. And each and every one of us need to make room in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes for you. 
joy to the world. You are the only one that can protect us, to love us, and to help us in a very chaotic time. We ask you. We love you. We need you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Ron.